Okay. Hello? Yes. Can please. you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you for the time. Um, Mr. Adam, or maybe Pak Adam in here, yeah. Um, I only have one question and I like to hear what you think about this. So my question is, could it be said that uh, the Democrats nomination of Biden and Harris is was a decision that shows Democrat concern for the state of their nation and not just because he wants to win the election. So that the Democrats uh, uh, kind of want to say that uh, this election is a battle of value and not just the battle for votes, uh, uh, namely the struggle to uh, for America to return to its identity, uh, such as making room for everyone, uh, equality, full of decency, uh, and so on. And also, uh, with the victory, uh, I should say victory now, uh, of Biden and Harris, does that mean it's also changing the foreign policy? Um, I would like to know what you think about that. Thank you. Thank you, Mas Aron Laka. Uh, the next one is Pak Syahrial. Pak Syahrial, could you share your question on comment to the forum, please? Thank you, Pak Irman. Uh, appreciate the, uh, the invitation. And uh, also Pak uh, Philip Formonte, especially also to Pak Adam. Um, well, I just have the several questions. Uh, the electoral college vote is a very interesting method. Uh, statistically, I saw 600,000 people for electoral college vote was determined, meaning as much as 30 states were below the average. Yeah? So Texas had 29 million population, but only has 38 ECV, uh, translating around 760,000 people per ECV. Wyoming, on the other hand, has 580,000 people, but only has three ECV, or 190,000 people per ECV. Do you think the system will be amended, and uh, uh, you know how 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 quick it's it's going to be, uh, you know, for for the change, because uh, it, it's just a changing of a demography of uh, of the United States, and also uh, to Pa Philip and Pa Adam. Will the U.S. change its investment policy to Indonesia, not on the natural resources as, as we have been seeing for the last years, you know, oil, gold, whatever, copper, you know, as, a, as what the China is doing right now, we've never learned about it, but, uh, but you know, promoting renewable energy in Indonesia, right, um, because um, the things I think will be, um, will be moving faster if there is a you know, big countries behind it. And uh, I believe the tension in South China Sea shall escalate and the uh, nuclear issue on North Korea and Iran also shall reappear. Uh, how do you see that the development end up, you know? Uh, uh, it would be very interesting to know. Thank you so much for the opportunity, appreciate it. Thank you, Pastor Ariel. Uh, I'm trying to call back pa Hardy Alunaza, are you are you here already? Otherwise, I'll call Parif Arifin to share the question. We have uh, other twenty-two minutes, so I think another two or one or two question uh, can be taken. Pa Rif Arifin, ada di sini. Then Ibu Yolanda. Ibu Yolanda just post the question. Ibu Yolanda, please. Uh, hello. Yes, Ibu. We can hear you clearly. Please uh, share the question. I thank you for the opportunity that has given to me. Uh, to all the speakers, uh, I'll just read my question. Uh, there is some rumor said that there is a prob probability of war that will that will happen in future under Joe Biden, same as when in era of uh, there. This is just some rumors, and I'm just asking if if there is any chance of those rumors will happen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
I think we have enough time to respond to those three questions. And the first, I would like to invite Dr. Philip to respond, then later on, uh, Adam Schwartz. Uh, Philip, uh, silakan. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, uh, it's hard to predict what uh, Joe Biden uh, will do. Uh, we can only uh, examine uh, written documents that he wrote. And then the, he wrote that piece again, the, uh, I mentioned again the, the foreign policy outline. Uh, he titled uh, his piece in foreign affairs, Rescuing U.S. Foreign Policy After Trump. Mm -hmm. And then, the, you know, in the, in the subtitles, in the, in, in, in the document, he said that he would pursue a foreign policy for middle class, for the middle class. What does it mean? Uh, he said that uh, uh, he would not enter into a new uh, trade deals overseas without consulting labor union within the U.S. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and workers union in the U.S. Environmental leaders, you know, should be on the table when, the, according to his document, uh, uh, will be uh, the voice of these uh, environmental uh, leaders would be taken uh, seriously and that uh, i think then the, uh, the us under joe biden if he is true to his word in the, in the document that he, he put uh, you know uh, uh, before the campaign then the, he would uh, insist the same thing to us partners and that i think uh, will <clears throat> uh, will be uh, you know uh, kind of a, a new issues for various especially uh, uh, developing countries because these issues have been uh, on the table for a long time and uh, it's a difficult one because uh, you know of course uh, now we are in the sustainable development mode and so on but still you know uh, there are uh, issues here and there so <clears throat> to pa uh, Shahriya, i think uh, you know uh, one thing for sure is that uh, biden would be willing to listen at the very least <laughs> about the concern from from uh, you know other countries, but uh, the principle of uh, especially uh, you know a president from from a democratic party from Democrats uh, in the U.S. remains the same that they would be uh, tough on the issue of labor, on the issue of environment uh, and so on. But uh, one thing uh, that is very interesting as well, uh, Joe Biden said in his foreign policy document that he would reinvest in innovation and technology. And uh, this is the area that the U.S. has been uh, lagged behind uh, against uh, China in the past uh, few years. But in terms of innovation, I think uh, we still have to acknowledge that the U.S. still the leaders of innovation uh, in technology and, and so on. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's more than welcome is the, if the U.S. Uh, invests more on innovation and technology and uh, we do hope that it will uh, as well, uh, you know, bring more investment in these areas, you know, to deal with, uh, you know, the world's problem, uh, be they trade, environment and others with the new approach of technology and the uh, investment uh, in, in this area is, is, is very important. And then the, <clears throat> in terms of energy, uh, renewable uh, energy has been the mantra of Obama, you know, during his presidency and Joe Biden was his vice president for those uh, long eight years. And uh, it will certainly, uh, I think, on the table. Uh, Joe Biden in the, the in the document, uh, you know, <clears throat> in his foreign policy uh, outline also state uh, very strongly that uh, the U.S. will insist China on China to stop China providing subsidies on uh, coal and energy, you know, non-renewable energies, uh, and then the, will. Uh, encourage China and other countries to invest more on uh, renewable energy as well. Uh, it is easier said than done, but uh, at least uh, from his uh, uh, you know track record uh, during the Obama presidency, he seems to be very serious in this particular areas. Back to you, Pak Sudirman. Sorry. Thank you, Pak Philip. Thank you, uh, Dr. Philip. Uh, I think this is your turn, Pak Adam, to respond to some questions. I would like Good. to Say hello to welcome Ibu Dr. Rosita Nur, Pak uh, Ihsan Lolembah, Dr. Binsar Simanjuntak, and also Dr. Darianto. Pak Adam, please. Uh, your turn. Yeah. 
And thanks for um, a good set a good set of questions. I, I don't think I um, can get to all of them, but let me let me try to um, uh, get to a couple of them. So, to the question from um, Narantaka, which is a very good one, which is really about kind of a values versus policy approach, and was that I think implicit in his question is is kind of is was that really the, the foundation of, of, of Joe Biden's candidacy. And I, I, I agree with you, right? or if that is, that is your view uh, from the question. Um, I think that's exactly right. I think um, if, you were, if you've been following the US election back through the, the primaries, the Democratic Party primaries, um, there was quite a wide variety of choice. There were, there were, there were, there were th people on the, the further to the left or the, the progressive candidates as they call themselves. Um, Particularly Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, um, even even to a certain degree Kamala Harris in the early part of the of the primary um, season, you know who were who were talking about the need for for much more radical change to, to the healthcare systems, the way the country deals with climate change, um, the way it deals with immigration, etc. Um, and the, the the Biden message, although although obviously he feels very strongly about some of these issues. I mean, he was one of the chief architects of Obamacare, and um, as as Philip said, absolutely right, he, he feels very very strongly about the threat of climate change and and, and the you know the urgency of the U.S. Um, tackling that. Um, but the 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 message that he settled on, which really resonated with the the U.S. Uh, audience was this one about values and decency and um, uh, a, a civil public decor, a discourse and, and not sort of all this yelling and screaming and, you know, uh, reliance on truth and science and scientists and experts. Um, I think all of, all of that sort of gradually built up. And so, to the, you know, I think you can mold all that together in a sense that that's kind of a set of values there in terms of, of how, how you want one's leaders to, to act and behave and, 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 and make decisions. Um, now we'll see how, you know, that, how far that lasts, you know, take, as, as always, it, take, it takes two to um, tango, as they say. So we'll see how, whether there really is appetite on the other side, which case is, is the Republican Party to find some common ground or, or whether this intense polarization of the body politic, which, you know, this had been polarized before Donald Trump had um, come to power, but it's gotten much worse over the last four years, whether, whether, and to what degree that's recoverable, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll I mean, as an American, I, I hope it is, um, but we'll have, we'll have to see, you know, it, again, it takes, it takes both sides to, to work on that. And when I say both sides, you know, think, think of Biden in the middle, he's got on one hand, a disappointed, riled up Trump, set of followers. Um, he also has on his other side in the Democratic Party, a bunch of people who, who feel that Biden's victory would have been much bigger if he had been more progressive, if he, if he had sort of not been so moderate, if you will. And so there'll be those people arguing that on, on his other side. He has a very, he has a very difficult road to, uh, to go. Um, to uh, to my Shahriyaz had a couple of good questions. One one the electoral college is you know it's, kind of, it's a bit of an arcane issue, but it's it's become a big issue in the United States because four out of the last five presidential elections have actually been won by the person who did not win the popular vote. Which you know if that becomes a pattern, it you know it starts to sound a little bit like minority rule. And so it's, it's a old system from 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 the Constitution which basically overweights the political representation to rural, less densely populated states. And, you know, by math, uh, underrepresents the representation from more urban, more densely populated states. And, and that's why um, you can have, a, you can lose the popular vote, but because, because, as, because the states, and then these are mainly, this is mainly a Republican Democrat, divide. Democrats are very well represented, well supported in, in the more dense and, and urban areas. Republicans have a lot of support in rural areas, but because those areas are overrepresented, so to speak, in the electoral college, um, that's why we've had a number of times in the last 20 years where the, the Republican party has won the minority of the total national vote, but because of the way the electoral college is structured in the way you pointed out in your question, um, the Republican has been able to win, including, including Donald Trump in, um, in 2016, who lost the popular vote by over 3 million votes. Um, 
you know, your question about um, U.S. investment in Indonesia, again, I, I think if I, if I heard the, the, where you were going with your question, I, I agree with that. I think there, there's going to, there's, well, indeed, there's already a shift underway away from kind of a natural resource heavy uh, investment profile, which, which is a, a transition that's been going on for a number of years now. But you'll, you'll, I think you'll see a continuation of that and, and more sort of tech heavy uh, investment. Um, in, in the digital uh, space um, in, in renewables. I think you'll see from the DFC, the Development Finance Corporation, which is a new entity in the US government. They, they've, they've got a big focus on Asia and in particular Indonesia, Vietnam, and India. And they're looking in particular to fund a number of renewable energy projects. So I think you'll see a bit more about that. Okay. Um, I, saw, I saw your question about Woodstock and I, I don't have an answer for that one. So I'll just- <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Uh, yes, I'm to Yolanda's question on on the Middle East, I you know my my view is that that those 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 are not uh, true rumors um, that that that's not going to happen. I, I think what we're going to see um, in a, in a foreign I mean it's frankly it's quite difficult to talk about foreign policy in this moment in time just because you know it's true in Indonesia it's true in America so much of the focus is on on the domestic agenda is dealing with covid and dealing with the economic um, consequences of covid that you know this has been a kind of an unusual presidential election in the united states in that foreign policy got very little coverage relative to to the domestic issues that's not normally the case um, but in terms of the, the principles by which foreign policy gets carried out, as Phillips was saying earlier, which I agree with, um, we will start to see a return to a more multilateral approach. The, the view in America by Americans and both Republican and Democrat is that they are generally pro-trade. Uh, they are generally pro having good relationships with allies. So this kind of protectionist, mercantilist, America first approach by Trump Although he carries it off because he, you know, there's a certain cult of personality there. But in terms of the policies itself, I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll quite quickly shift back to sort of the more traditional you know, post-World War II traditional American posture, which is, you know, playing a leading role in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a global uh, world, a global trading world, and that, uh, that multilateral institutions are important to make, to make that world work, you know, work effectively. Um, so if I, if I understood your question correctly, that's, that's my thought on that. Thanks. Thank you, Madam. We still have uh, eight minutes. Let's uh, use the rest of the time to take two questions from two ladies. Someone from Jakarta Post, Dian Septiari, and then someone from Secretariat Wapres, uh, Asia Atiatul Huda. Mbak Dian, uh, silakan. Silakan. Thank you, uh, Pak Said. Uh, I have a question about ASEAN because we know that uh, this weekend there will be an ASEAN summit, although it's going to be virtual, but I am sure that there will be a lot of uh, discussion or uh, chatter about uh, the, ele the election results. So I want to ask uh, the panel's opinion, what would uh, that uh, affect the discussion about uh, in the ASEAN summit, especially prob probably South China Sea, Indo-Pacific strategies, etc. Uh, I wonder what's uh, your opinion about that. Thank you. Thank you, Marian. And the last question, I think, from Atiatul Huda from Chatwa Press. Mbak Atiatul Huda. Thank you very much, Pak Sudirman. Hi, everyone. My name is Ati from Vice President Office. Thank you for the opportunity. My question to the speakers is, um, I read um, Mr. Biden's essay entitled Why America Must Lead Again, also published in Foreign Affairs. And there he mentions that under his presidency, he will set the refugee admission at 1, 125,000 people and will try to increase that number over the course of his presidency. My question is, since the U.S. is heavily impacted by the pandemic, and as Mr. Adams said, the focus will still be um, domestic issues, uh, mostly COVID, how he will realize this plan and how the Indonesia can cooperate with the U.S. government since uh, Indonesia is a um, transit country for asylum seekers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. So uh, now... Uh... It's time for Adam to respond and then uh, ending with the closing statement. Then later on, Dr. Phillips will also give 
is uh, respond. Padam, please. Very good, Padirman. Um, to um, to the the, um, the 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 first to to Dion's question about ASEAN. Um, well, probably I'll, first thing I say is probably Phillips is, is better better position to answer it, but I'll I'll, I'll take a crack at it. Um, I, I think you know, you know again I. I don't want this to be disappointing. I, I, I don't think from, from a U.S. point of view that there's going to be a huge amount of attention on it just because the whole country is really wrapped up in what's going to, you know, what's going to happen in, to the presidential election um, uh, at home. I think from, a, from an ASEAN point of view, you know, as, you know, I've spent a lot of time in ASEAN trying, you know, looking at it from different countries' perspectives. My, my, my hunch would be that the ASEAN head states right now um, will not go further than the foreign ministers did um, earlier in the year. They'll probably, I think, say the same things about the law of the sea and the code of conduct and, and all those things. I suspect that um, until they get a sense of, you know, where the U.S. is going to go on this issue, um, they'll probably... Um, just bide their time a little bit and 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 and, um, and and see where it goes. I don't I don't know whether we could get a consensus in ASEAN to go further at this stage than the, than where the foreign ministers kind of had landed um, six months ago. Um, in terms of of um, of immigration, um, uh, you know, I, I think yeah, there's going to be an issue on the pandemic. I, I, I do think it is, however, a core issue of the Democratic Party that the U.S. needs to go back to a more humane uh, policy on immigration and on asylum seekers. Um, some of you may have followed sort of the Trump's thing um, approach of separating children from their family at the Mexican border, and that became a very emotive issue in, in the election campaign. Um, that's not sort of, I think, the view of America that most Americans um, want to have. Um, and so I, I think there'll be a, you know, um, uh, by, President like Biden has already said that one of his first acts is going to be sort of removing the Trump ban on travel from mostly Muslim countries, which I think is very welcome and overdue. Um, I think he'll, he'll lower the pressure on sort of immigrants in, that have been here for a long time, particularly their children that have grown up in America, which had been threatened by expulsion um, by, by Donald Trump. Um, in terms of the, the specific question that you'd asked about how, how Indonesia fits into that, um, I, don't, I don't, you know, yes, there, there is some issue with the transit country for asylum. That, that's frankly an issue with, mainly an issue with Indonesia and Australia, not, not, not the US. I don't think the US really, it, typically historically has played a big, a big role in that particular debate. I think the over, and maybe this is sort of a segue into a, a closing state or, or just a you know, final remark on my end is that I think the mood, the mood in Washington that we're gonna see is that um, from a foreign policy point of view, the, the, the dominant trend we're gonna see is a re-engagement with allies and friends around the world um, and, and, and sort of a, a, a retreat or maybe that's the bad way to put it, you know, a walking away from this kind of America first approach that a bilateral approach to the world's problems and issues is better for America than a multilateral approach. That's not actually how most Americans think. And I think Biden is going to sort of walk away from that and walk back to what has historically been a much more common situation. I think there's also going to be less of a tendency, which we're already starting to see in the Trump administration, that the U.S.-China um, competition um, has, is taking on sort of a Cold War feel to it, like you're either on our side or you're not type thing. Um, I don't think that's healthy for America. I think, I think a lot of the foreign policy elite, elite in America does not think that's healthy. I think Biden will be walking back from that. And, um, you know, there's going to be some issues that are, are, you know, the U.S. feels very strongly about in terms of China's trade practices and forced technology transfer and things like that. Those, those will remain difficult issues to, to resolve. Um, but I think what, what you're likely to see is that the U.S. handles itself in the foreign policy arena in a more collaborative, or to use the word, a multilateral way than what you've seen over the last four years. That is both my, my expectation and, and, and my hope. So let me, let, me, let me stop there. Thank you, Madam. So the last, yeah. Dr. Billips respond to the question. Yeah, uh, very quick, very quick one. I agree uh, with uh, 
Pak Adam's response to uh, some of the questions that uh, as far as the ASEAN summit is concerned, uh, Joe Biden will not be the president of the United States until January. So, you know, he will be sworn in in January. So right now, Trump is still in the presidency and then, the, uh, then it will be difficult for the ASEAN leaders at this point in time, you know, <clears throat> react and uh, uh, thinking about what ASEAN should do uh, with the United States. But uh, I think the summit uh, will certainly discuss uh, somehow uh, what does it mean for ASEAN uh, that uh, now Trump uh, has been defeated and how I think uh, uh, China will react uh, to that fact. And that uh, relates to the question of South China Sea. But again, South China Sea has long been a problem. It will, be, it will not be solved uh, quickly, but uh, I think uh, we are on the negotiation, uh, negotiating table with China uh, on the uh, code of conduct and so on. They will probably want to uh, fasten, uh, to quicken the, the whole negotiation uh, process on South China Sea. And uh, on the refugee, uh, I'm no expert on that particular issue. And uh, I think uh, I, uh, I agree with, uh, uh, Adam has already responded to that question. Now, uh, you know, for the closing statement, I think what we have been learning from the US election and then the, uh, the drama and all the debates uh, of this uh, 2020 presidential election in the US is that now we know our problems in Indonesia is not unique. All countries face the same problem, you know, be they strong democracy, rich country, poor country, non-democracy, they, they have, we have to deal with, you know, the, the pandemic, uh, there are problems with the trust of science, uh, we do have problems everywhere about the preparedness of our health system, you know, in, in dealing with pandemics and disasters and so on. So we are not unique, and then the, because we are not unique, then we have to cooperate with other countries. Uh, because we are basically facing the, the, the same problems and that uh, give a fresh uh, air uh, that Joe Biden is, uh, has been elected president because he's, he, he, he seems to be someone that uh, believes in multilateralism, which in essence is basically cooperation, not unilateral action by a superpower. But uh, last night I had a chance, uh, a very interesting webinar, a meeting with the Council of Foreign Relations by Adam, and, and uh, uh, there's an insight from uh, Richard Haas, and a very interesting one, that uh, uh, the U.S. will return to multilateralism, but it, it's going to be probably a different kind of multilateralism. Mm -hmm. Multilateralism in which not only the governments who decide, but multilateralism in which NGOs, experts, you know, scientists, and then uh, labor unions, uh, you know, all these non-governmental actors will be in this new kind of multilateralism because what we are facing right now is a problem that requires multi-stakeholders to chip in, you know, like the pandemic and the environment. So that's something we need to prepare as well. Uh, if we are not democratic enough, we will see the U.S. as interfering once again with uh, governments across uh, countries that they will require leaders uh, you know, to listen to the labor union, environment activists, uh, and so on and so forth, media as well. So then the, I think this is good that the US now uh, hopefully back on track. And uh, that way we will have the chance as well to consolidate our democracy because you know, it will be required for international relations across the globe because Time requires us to be democratic to deal with pandemic and environmental and climate change problems. Right. Agreed. Thank you very much, Dr. Phillips. I think both of you has uh, expressed very fundamental remark on the closing statement, and, and I agree that uh, there are many issues still going on, and it's too early to conclude anything. But uh, for sure, the win of multilateralism is, I think. This is now uh, coming, and, and I think uh, we learned so much from the forum, and I hope uh, all of you enjoy the forum. And again, Adam, now it's already 10.30 uh, late evening, so thank you for uh, still keeping up. And Dr. Phillips, uh, thank you very much again, and Bapak Ibu sekalian, selamat uh, menutup acara ini, dan terima kasih. For those who need the certificate, yang butuh sertifikat silakan menghubungi sekretariat karena teman-teman akademisi mungkin perlu itu. Sekali lagi 
really appreciate and thank you very much for being here and uh, let's conclude with the giving a big hand to the uh, speakers terima kasih pak terima kasih pak adam thank you thank you thank you, uh, thank you very much thank you. Okay. Uh, dari Anto, terima kasih ada Pak baru datang eh, baru memunculkan wajahnya ada Bu Egi juga thank you <laughs> bye bye terima kasih Pak Dirman thank you terima kasih Bapak terima kasih Ati terima kasih Ati terlalu Pak thanks oh Pak Ika Sehat-sehat ya Mas Eka ya. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Oke, betul betul semoga masih. Oke.